1 is Acts chapter 1, one singular verse, verse number 14. It reads like this. It says, And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now I want us to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. The Bible says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord and one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and he filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Lord, we thank you for your word today. I pray that you would embolden this word upon our hearts. And Lord, help us to ha- hear your heart today. Lord, I pray against all distractions and hindrances right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that you would apprehend them. And may our hearts be apprehended to your word. Lord, we thank you for it today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you're seated, turn around and tell somebody with a big smile on your face, good morning. Hallelujah. We're glad that you are here this morning on this Sunday morning. God is good. He's faithful. He's worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship. Listen, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, what a joy it was for our 100-year celebration for Pastor Darren Pilcher. Didn't he preach a good word? This same Jesus is the same. I am going to uh, be piggybacking off that a little bit. He had no idea where I was going this next month, but I'm going to be piggybacking off that a little bit um, because we're going to pick off there in the Scripture. But let me tell you something. God is good. Over the last several weeks, I have been um, in travail uh, in my own soul. Um, uh, in a season of prayer. I've called our staff to a season of prayer. We have pre-service prayer on on, uh, Wednesday nights as well. And just in every spare moment of my time throughout the day, uh, it doesn't matter what I'm doing or where I'm going, I find myself praying under my breath and sometimes just praying in the Spirit. And I know that that God is, is trying to position us to a deeper place of prayer and intimacy with Him. Um, That's why this morning I want to entitle this brand new series, Prevailing Prayer, that comes from a scripture in the book of James where the Bible says that Elijah was a man of like passions just as we were. And yet the Bible says he prayed and it did not rain. And the Bible says that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so I'm talking to you this morning from the subject of prevailing prayer. Somebody say prevailing prayer. Now I want to tell you a story. This happened some years ago. Some years ago, I happened to stop by my mom and my stepdad's house on an afternoon. I think I was off work that day. My mom was at work. My stepdad was uh, at home by himself. He was out in the shop doing some work. At this time, they just had um, um, some beams up, and he was putting, building the shop, basically. He was putting the tin on the exterior and hanging some trusses and some things. And it was a still summer afternoon. The grass had grown out in the pasture, and so it, it had gotten kind of dry and And he had his welding machine on, and I just so happened to to stop by and see him. And he's welding when all of a sudden he's moving down the beam and he's welding something low when a summer wind blew through. And all of a sudden that wind grabbed the sparks from that welder and within a moment of seconds caught the entire pasture on fire. We watched as that pasture began to just go up in smoke and how we watched literally the fire travel up to their mobile home there in South Arkansas and literally start burning underneath the bricks where the propane tank was outside. It was a very dangerous moment. And there's something that I realized. I realized two things. Number one, I realized the importance of volunteer fire departments. Hello. Because when you live out in the middle of nowhere, thank God for the men and women who work to keep our communities safe. So if you do that this morning, God bless you. My hats are off to you. Um, Also, the second thing that I learned is that it only takes a spark to start a fire. 
Amen. It only takes a spark to really cause some damage. Don't we know that out here in northwest Oklahoma? There's seasons of dryness that happen where fires, it could be a chain dragging from a trailer. It could be a cigarette butt flipped out of the window. It could be a power line that sparks from the wind that causes these fires to embolden in our lives. And I want you to know something, that prayer is a lot like that spark. It contains great power. And when the Holy Spirit breathes upon prayer, it can cause transformation in such a short matter of time. I want you to know that as we look at the subject of prevailing prayer and the power of prayer, if prayer is indeed like a spark that the wind can blow upon and cause great transformation, then my question to us this morning is this Is there any wonder? Why Satan himself fights prayer more than anything else? Is there a wonder why the prayer meeting of the local church across America, statistically speaking, is the least attended of all functions? You can get people to women's tea. You can get people out to hot dogs. You can get the kids out to bounce houses. You can get them to co-ed softball tournaments. But you cannot get people to prayer. And I believe that the the enemy has sowed a spirit of slumber amongst God's people to cause us to forget where our power actually comes from. Our power does not come from our own abilities. Our power does not come from our own strength. Our power comes from the Lord. Our hope comes from Him, and our strength comes from connecting to the power source of prayer and and letting the Lord build us, mold us, and shape us into the person that He wants us to be. Every movement that has ever uh, transversed this planet has been birthed in prayer. The Azusa Street Revival was birthed in prayer. The Great Awakening was birthed in prayer. The revivals that have happened in Latin America, South America, they were birthed in prayer as men, women, boys, and girls were tired of societal norms and decided to hit their knees and to bombard heaven with their request. God, change us. God, save our nation. God, save our families. And it was when people actually prayed that what happened was the wind of the Holy Spirit blew upon the embers of those sparks and caused revival to happen amongst the people. I want you to know something this morning, that there's only so much that we can do in our own strength. We can learn the songs. We can learn the key changes. We can learn the lighting cues. We can have the best graphics. We can have the most amazingness of social media. We can have so many likes and views on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever the the platform might be. But if it's not birthed in prayer, it is wood, hay, and stubble. It'll be burnt up by the trials and fires of judgment when we stand before a holy God. Why? Because only that which is birthed in a place of prayer will last for eternity. We serve a God who is serious about prayer. Not only do we serve a God who's serious about prayer, he modeled it. Jesus modeled this prayer life, which kind of blows out of water this whole idea that we should only pray when we do bad things. We talk about repentance, right? Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. And for a lot of people, that's the only motor method of prayer that they have. Well, how many of you know Jesus was sinless? He never sinned. He didn't commit adultery. He didn't lie. He didn't cheat. He didn't steal. But the Bible says early in the morning, he prayed. Late in the evening, he prayed. What did he pray about? He had communion with the Father. He got instructions from heaven every morning that this is the way I'm to go. In fact, the Bible says Jesus didn't do anything unless he saw the Father doing it. I want you to know something, that our daily instructions are wrapped up in a place of prayer. The reason why so many of us get in trouble is because we jump off the diving board and ask God to catch us mid-jump instead of asking God, do you really want me to jump in the first place? 
See, that's the difference between praying to get out of trouble and praying to circumvent trouble. God wants to give us insight in our life and give us power to prevail to see the kingdom of God advance, but we have to learn to position ourselves to get into a place of prayer. Hallelujah. Are you still with me this morning? Listen, this is what happened at the birth of the church in the book of Acts. Up to the point of the crucifixion, Jesus was in a time of prayer. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying. His disciples were sleepy. Peter was supposed to be awake, slept through his prayer time, and he cut somebody's ear off. Can I tell you, if you sleep through your prayer time, oftentimes you create more work for God. But Jesus modeled prayer in difficult seasons of life. Even on the cross, he was communing with the Father, saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then Jesus, as he's getting ready to leave for glory, the Bible says he gives his disciples some instruction recorded in the last chapter of the book of Acts. He says, but you, you go and you tarry in Jerusalem, and you wait until you receive the promise of the Father the promise of the precious Holy Spirit. And so they went there on the day of the season of Pentecost where people would come and they would report to um, uh, the, the, the different things that they had to do and they had to offer their sacrifices to God. And so they were there. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it's our text this morning, it says, And these all continued in one accord and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. I want you to notice the Bible says, and they all continued in one accord. Somebody say one accord. What I want to show you this morning is that there is power in praying together. Listen, I'm all about personal prayer. Listen, I believe personal prayer predicates public power. When you pray in private, God blesses you in public. The the scriptural principle for that is what you do in secret, God rewards openly. There's a time to be still and know that he's God. There's a time for us to steal away to a solitary place and pray. But the Bible also teaches that there is a time where we are to come together in unity. To come together in one accord with supplication, with request, with thanksgiving, with worship, with praise, and to lift up and exalt the name of Jesus. The Bible tells us that that's something that we've got to do. I want us to look back at Acts chapter 2 this morning. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. What am I trying to tell you this morning, church? I'm trying to tell you that the foundation of prayer is our spiritual foundation. The foundation of prayer is our spiritual foundation. We are trying to make a Frankenstein of the modern church. We've built churches on worship ministries. That's why you have elevation with a pastor who preaches all kind of heretical doctrine. It's why you got Bethel doing crazy things, and I love them, but they do crazy things, and people tolerate it because it's good music. He never said, my father's house shall be called a house of worship. He said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. Say amen, somebody. My father's house should be called a house of prayer, and we are supposed to be people of prayer. 
If we don't have preaching, if we don't have music, if we don't have all of these auxiliary ministries, the one thing we should have is prayer. It's the most important thing. But rather, prayer has become the stepchild, the Cinderella of the modern church. Friends, you and I, if we want the fire of Pentecost, if we want the signs, wonders, and miracles, if we want the salvations, the transformations, if we want the calls to ministry, if we want all of these things, we must start redigging the wells of our forefathers and rebuilding the altars of the past. The first thing that a lot of the young leaders did in the Old Testament after they followed a wicked king was to tear down the Asher of poles and to rebuild the altars and to restore the worship of God. Friends, here's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. If we want to see the fire, we have to build an altar. Is anybody with me this morning? If you want to see the fire, you have to build an altar. The fire did not fall when Elijah consecrated that holy altar on top of that mountain with the prophets of Baal until the wood was laid in order. God has a divine prescription, if you will, on how we are to worship and how we are to press and how we are to build. And prayer is indeed the foundation of the church. Hallelujah. This church was founded because somebody had a burden in prayer. Missionaries are launched because somebody has a burden in prayer. And you and I, if we're going to do anything for God, we're going to have to have a burden for prayer. Amen? We're going to have to have a burden for prayer. Listen, in Acts chapter 1, Pastor Darren preached this last Sunday. He said, this same Jesus whom you've seen go will also come in like manner. Jesus went into the clouds of glory. And the Bible says he's coming in like manner. He's coming in the clouds of glory. And here's what the Bible says, church. The Bible says he's coming back for a bride that's without spot and is without wrinkle and without any such thing. He's not coming back for a weak church. He's coming back for not an emaciated church. He's coming back for a powerful church. He's coming back for a church that will be full of power and glory before the Lord returns. And let me tell you, if that's going to be the case, then we can't be born in power and go out of here in a puff of smoke. Hello, somebody. If we're born in power, we have to continue the pattern, which is the pattern of prayer. We've got to continue the pattern of prayer. But the truth is, in most most religious circles, there's more fire under the coffee pot than there is the altar. And the truth is the majority of our jumping is more about Red Bull than it is our testimony. I feel a prophetic unction on me today. I've got one life to live and one chance to change it. And the folks, listen, this morning I'm telling you the God honest truth. If, if we don't have nothing, Lord, strip us away to a place of prayer. Lord, strip us away to a place of intimacy. Strip us away to a place where we have nothing to rely upon about you. Let every kingdom that can be shaken be shaken. Let every foundation that's faulty slip away. Only that which is belonging to you shall remain because Jesus, you alone are worthy of the glory, the honor, and the praise in the church of the living God. God said, Amen. Hallelujah. It's important this morning that we get back to a foundation of prayer. I want to show you something this morning, church. Four things in these texts that show us the importance of prayer. Are you ready? Number one, here it goes. Number one, prevailing prayer unites us. Unites us. They came together in one accord. One mind, one purpose. One mind, one purpose. Somebody say one mind. Somebody say one purpose. You know, churches spend lots of money trying to formulate their mission statement. What's the mission of our church? Can I tell you, the church doesn't have a mission. 
The church doesn't have a mission. It's opposite of that. The mission has a church. The mission has a church. See, the mission is the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. The mission is go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Listen, our mission is to reach people for Jesus Christ. Our mission is to reach the lost at any cost. Our mission is to save souls and to tell them that Jesus loves them. He died for them. He's coming for them. He has a plan for their life. We have an obligation to the world around us to reach people with this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Friend, listen, and that mission is not our own. It's His. And so prayer unifies us around that mission. The Bible says they were all in one place. And as the book of Acts says, they were in one accord. Friends, I'm not trying to be funny this morning, but that doesn't mean a Honda. It means they had the same mind. They had the same goal. They had the same passion, which was to see the Lord move to see his church grow, to see people saved, healed, delivered, set free. So I can tell you people who are disunified are people who aren't of prayer. Because when you're a person of prayer, God unifies your heart and knits it together. See, we've got to come, come together, church, in one accord, setting aside differences, focusing on seeking God's presence. Just as the early church was unified in prayer, we too should strive for unity in our prayer lives, understanding that together we are stronger. Prevailing prayer unifies us. Let me ask you a question this morning. What would church look like if each one of us on Saturday night and Sunday morning spent our time on our knees before God and we said, Lord, move in my church Lord, move in our church. Lord, wake up your backsliding children. Lord, wake them up. Let them hear their alarm clocks. Lord, let the musicians be anointed today. Let the teachers be anointed today. Lord, bless our pastor. Speak through him today. We know he's crazy, Lord. He needs a lot of help. Lord, bless him today in the name of What would happen? If we prayed every day like that for service, but here's the truth, and I, I, I second what Leonard Ravenhill, the late Leonard Ravenhill said. He said, the tragic truth in the modern church is this. We spend more time preparing our hair than we do our hearts. What an indictment today. What an indictment today that we're so concerned with the external and what pleases the flesh and vanity when the truth is at the end of the day, it's all fleeting. It's all failing. The only thing that matters is the presence of God. Prevailing prayer unifies us. This is why corporate prayer is of the utmost importance. It's the utmost importance. Here's the second thing. Prevailing prayer prepares us. Not only does it unify us, but it prepares us. That group of people went into that upper room, and they were waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. They were waiting for the promise of the Father, the endowment of power from on high. They were waiting there in that place. They were seated there together, lifting up their voices, lifting up their hearts. And the Bible says that as they were in one place and one accord, there came a sound from heaven. It was a rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled the entire place where they were sitting there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire that sat upon each of them. And the Bible says, and they were all filled with the precious power of the Holy Spirit. Before I get ahead of ourselves this morning too much, number two, prevailing prayer prepares us. Prepares us. See, not only does it unify us, but it prepares us. See, when we submit ourselves to a place of, pr of prayer, it prepares us for the next in our life. It prepares us for the next 
in our life. And if you don't submit yourself to a place of prayer, what will happen is you'll, you'll end up with an Ishmael instead of an Isaac. If you don't submit yourself to a place of prayer, you'll actually end up with a monster. But when we submit ourselves to prayer, it prepares us. I want you to notice that there was a time between the moment that they went into the upper room, it was days before the promise of the Holy Spirit fell. And see, one thing that we have to get back to in prayer is waiting. Waiting. Everything, don't miss this, everything in our society has gotten faster except God's processes. We were coming through my, uh, looking through my dad's things and doing those things that you have to do. And, you know, it's taxing, it's daunting. One thing about my dad's unique, and I didn't realize this, he wasn't a hoarder. His house was immaculately clean. But one thing that I found is the man threw away nothing. Zero. Actually found a love letter my mom wrote him when they first started dating. They had broken up. It was pretty neat. Um found all kind of things. He just didn't throw away anything. Every bill he ever paid was rubber banded with the date he paid on the front of it. I mean, there was stacks and stacks and stacks. But one of the things that I found was a bag phone. Does anybody remember those? My kids thought it was manna. They said, what is it? You know, they didn't know what it was. And I told them, kids, this is what cell phones used to look like. There was a big thing like this. You had to plug it in the cigarette lighter. You had to put a big antenna out the top of the window, and that's just, and you didn't dare talk on them because it was like a 1999 a minute or something like that. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things. I found old phones. I found old Internet modems. I found you, you name it. And so back in the day, that technology was so slow. Anybody remember dial-up Internet? Felt like it literally was dialing to China you know, all these little sounds it make and everything. And now what we have, faster, 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 faster. And even drive through food is not fast enough for us. And so if we have to wait more than two and a half minutes for something, we get extremely frustrated and upset. But what we fail to forget is we, I didn't coin this phrase, it's cliche, but we, we serve a crockpot God, but we live in a microwave generation. And we can't forget that in the Bible, sometimes years happen before answers came to pass. But prayer prepares us to receive what God has for us. You see, because prayer is not just you speaking to God. Prayer is also God speaking to you. And the reason why some of your lives are so crazily unorganized and scattered is because you only pray telling God what you want and then you go about your business. When God really wants you to pause and let him speak to you, that happens different ways. I'm not saying you're going to hear an audible voice from heaven. Sometimes you might. It didn't happen that much in the scripture, but it, it's possible. But you're going to hear it in your heart. You may open the scripture up to something that, that speaks to you. God is speaking all the kinds of different ways. But how can he speak to us if we don't allow ourselves to be prepared in a place of prayer so that he can speak to us? Listen, don't forget this. Everything worthwhile is birthed through prayer. The Bible tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and thanksgiving, make your supplication and requests known unto God. See, we think, well, that's just a small need. God doesn't care about it. God doesn't care about my headache. He doesn't care about my ingrown toe. And I even, somebody had some trouble one time, and I asked them, I was like, well, have you prayed about it? They said, I don't want to bother God. Do you think your God is so small? 
that your request would bother him? The God who knows the hairs on your head or the lack thereof, I should say the hair in your ears would be more accurate for me. He knows the blades of, your, of, the, of the grass in your yard. He knows all of those things. And we think that it's a, it's a taxation upon God to bother him in prayer. Are you serious? God wants to hear from us. But, but listen, it's in the place of prayer that God prepares us for what's next. See, the early church, they prayed persistently, creating an atmosphere of expectation. And listen, likewise, we should pray with anticipation, awaiting an answer for God. Listen, can I tell you the honest truth? I can tell you why men and women don't pray. There's only one answer. It's simple. It's not lack of time. It's lack of faith. It's lack of faith. Because if you really believed that God heard you when you prayed, and you truly believe that he answered prayer according to his will, you would pray. You'd pray about everything. But we've been conditioned to think differently about God, to think that he's a genie on the bottle, and that we get magical wishes if we do certain things and we rub the bottle a certain way. Listen, can I tell you, there's really no such thing as an unanswered prayer. Garth Brooks wrote a beautiful song, but it's bad theology. Because there's no such thing. Can I tell you why? Because sometimes the answer is no. But we don't like that. Because we serve a God who would never tell us no because he wants us happy all the time. Can I tell you, God's not concerned so much about your happiness as he is your holiness. God's concerned about your character. He's concerned about your witness. He's concerned about how you represent him in the earth. All of those things matter to God. And listen, when we put ourselves in a place of prevailing prayer, it prepares our hearts. Prepares us. Listen, I was speaking with somebody recently about a terribly personal situation. And I'll tell you, the question rose up like, how do I pray for these people if I want to do bad things to them. Now, you may be so sanctified you've never had those thoughts. But you let somebody hurt your children, hurt your spouse, steal from you, wrong from you, and tell me you don't have thoughts. So I said, the answer is easy. Well, no, not easy, but it's clear. Pray for those who persecute you. And for those who despitefully use you. And I took them to the answer of David. David in Psalms at one point is so frustrated. He's praying. He says, Lord, would you crush the bones of my enemies? Would you grind them into powder? May their children never remember them anymore. He starts his prayer out that way. And then when you get halfway through that particular psalm, he's like praying for them, God. See, what am I trying to say? Prayer prepares you. He didn't start out right, but he ended right. You know why? Because prayer isn't so much about changing things as much as it is about changing us. Because we're the ones that are supposed to be aligning ourselves with the kingdom of heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, prayer prepares us and prepares our hearts to be in position with the Lord. When we pray, we're positioning ourselves in alignment with heaven. It's important. Here's the third thing. You ready? Prevailing prayer empowers us. It empowers us. See, not only were they united, not only were they prepared, but number three, they were empowered. Because the Bible says when they came together and they prayed, and they prayed together, and they prayed in unison, the Bible says there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing of a mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. How prophetic that air conditioner just kicked on. Do you know what? That air conditioner kicked on, and, and you're going to feel that breeze all throughout this house. 
because we're in here corporately. And when they prayed, something happened corporately. It filled the house. But then the Bible says something else happened. And there appeared to them cloven tongues as a fire. It sat upon each of them. See, what I'm trying to show you is in this moment, something happened corporately, but something also happened personally. There was wind that filled the house, but there was fire that sat upon the individuals. And I want you to know something, that a personal anointing is found connected to the corporate gathering. God has called us to be a part of the local church. And there are a lot of people who want the anointing and they want things, but they're renegade, they're rogue, they're not connected to anybody, they're doing their own thing. But God empowers us when we come together. And that corporate power sits upon each one of us and he empowers us to do what it is we're called to do. Prevailing prayer empowers us. Folks, we got to seek the empowerment of the Holy Spirit through prayer. If you're struggling, you don't know what to do, you don't have the power to witness, you don't have the power to soul win, you're timid, you're shy, you're meek, you need the power of God upon your life to touch you, to change you, to transform you. Prevailing prayer, it empowers us. These believers were seeking the power of the Holy Spirit. And guess what happened? They received that which they were seeking. Now, here's what I want to tell you this morning. And I don't want to get into this too much today. But this glorious experience of the power of the Holy Spirit is not just a one-time experience. It's not just a one-time experience. See, some people treat the baptism of the Holy Spirit like, like it's a, a thing. I did that. I did that. Like baptism, like water baptism. I did that. Way back then, that happened. The Bible doesn't teach it that way. The Bible teaches a continual infilling of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you why. Because we have cups that leak. We have cups that leak. Honey, could you hand me one of those bottles there? Thank you. Well, let, me, let me show you something. This cup, this, this bottle, it's just water. It won't hurt anything. Is, is full. Do you agree? What happens if I it bumps along the way? There's a little less full than it was. What, what happens if I stumble over here and more water spills out? Well, if I keep doing that, what's going to happen is I'm going to find this thing half full, right? Well, the disciples found themselves in this situation. See, in Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they found themselves in a battle. They found themselves in a battle. They're out preaching, and people don't like what they're saying because they're calling people to repentance. They're saying Jesus is the only way. Judaism cannot save you. The keeping of the Torah cannot save you. And people are mad. They're frustrated. People are going to jail. People they know are being persecuted and executed even. And I want you to notice, men, this scripture's not on the screen, but I want you to notice Acts chapter 4, verse number 13. Let's read it together, this passage. It says, And being let go, they were, went to their own companions, and they reported to all the chief priests and elders. They had said to them, So when they had heard, they raised their voice to God in one accord. There's that language again. And said, Lord, you are God 
who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? And the kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. And look at this next verse right here. He says, For truly against you, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to do. Now, Lord, look on us. Look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Now I want you to put verse 32 on the screen. Can you do that? 32. Notice what he says. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God with boldness. Acts 4, 32. Look at it. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one accord. They had all things in common. The Bible, the Bible tells us that they were assembled together and power was in the church. What power? Amen? Amen? Yeah, I think that was verse 30. It might have been 31. Verse 31. Notice, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled, somebody say assembled, together was shaken. Church, here's what I'm trying to tell you. There has to be some times where we inconvenience ourselves to come together and pray. Amen? We can't have a church of 200 people and have eight people come to prayer. We have to come to a place of prayer. Amen? Because if we want the place to be shaken, we have to assemble together and allow the Holy Spirit to bring transformation into our lives. Because I got news for somebody. The answer to the drug problem in Woodward County, the answer to all of the fatherlessness in our city, the answer to all of the crime and all of the things that are going on, the answer to everything is prayer. It's not more ads, it's not newspaper ads, it's not Facebook ads, it's not anything like that. The answer is prayer. And I believe, church, that God is calling us to a place of prayer. Because not only does prayer empower us, I'm closing. Number four, prayer transforms us. Transforms us. Through consistent and heartfelt prayer, we experience personal growth, spiritual maturity, and a deep relationship with God. You see, when we come to a place of prayer, we say, Lord, it's not about me. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Not my ideas, Lord, your ideas. Not my thoughts, but your thoughts. Not my ways, but your ways. Lord, I'm coming to you right now, and I'm asking you, Lord, to transform my life. And listen, what happens when we build that foundation of prayer? God begins to unify us. He begins to prepare us. He begins to empower us. He begins to transform us. Because here's the thing. A praying church is a powerful church. A praying church is a powerful church. And I don't know about you this morning, but I just want His presence. 
I want his presence so strong I can't pick myself up off the floor. I want his presence so strong that I can't move forward. I want his presence so strong. The Bible says that when the glory of the, of, of the temple was filled, the Bible says that the breath of Queen Sheba left her body. The Bible says that the, the, the priest couldn't stand to minister because of the presence of God. And that only comes when we build a holy altar and we say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Transform me. Mold me. Take me. I belong to you. That's the foundation of prayer. Listen, the book of Acts church was birthed in prayer. And if we want what they had, we have to do what they did. And that's to pray. So in just a moment, in just a moment, I'm going to call us all to a place of prayer. But right now, I want you to stand.